All right, so welcome to our first audio lesson here. I'm going to be talking about chapter two. I hope everybody's doing good today. I'm going to pull out a few details that I thought were important to focus on, uh, some details that weren't necessarily uh, addressed in the questions in depth, and things that I would like you to uh, be critically thinking about. Some of these uh, elements that I'm asking you to think about, uh, you will be writing um, a discussion response on Google Classroom, and we will try our hand at seeing how we can hold a full class discussion uh, in this online platform. Okay, so the first thing I'm looking at is on page uh, 14 to 15. It starts with the ceremony for ones. So I just want to reread this section and then pull out each of um, the details that I think are important to pay attention to. The ceremony for ones was always noisy and fun. Each December, all the new children born in the previous year turned one. One at a time, there were always 50 in each year's group, if none had been released. They had been brought to the stage by the nurturers, who had cared for them since birth. Some were already walking, wobbly, on their unsteady legs. Others were no more than a few days old, wrapped in blankets, held by their nurturers. I enjoy the naming, Jonas said. His mother agreed, smiling. The year we got Lily, we knew, of course, that we'd receive our female because we'd made our application and been approved. But I'd been wondering and wondering what her name would be. I could have sneaked a look I could have sneaked a look at the list prior to the ceremony, Father confided. The committee always makes the list in advance, and it's right there in the office at the nurturing center. So a few of the details in here are um, important to think about because it establishes how the families, the family units, uh, operate much differently than our families. In addition, I want you to be thinking about how much choice people have in their family units in this society versus how much choice we have in the establishment of our own families. So first thing uh, it mentions is that there were always 50 in each year's group if none had been released. So what does that say about this community? If there were always 50, no more than 50, no less than 50, each year. You know, think about Putnam Valley. I'm not quite sure how many babies are born each year, but I'm pretty sure that the number uh, is variable. Some years, I'm sure there's a lot more than others. Uh, I don't even know if there are 50 babies born in uh, put in the valley each year? Probably not. But there's a difference there. there. There's no regulation on how many babies need to be born. So what does that mean for parents if there could only be 50 babies born in the community each year? Next thing to think about is that the nurturers cared for them since birth. Well, if the nurturers are caring for them since birth, what are the parents doing? And then there's the naming. The year we got Lily, we knew, of course, that we'd receive our female because we'd made an application and been approved. So it's implying that it is not really a choice when each family uh adds on to their family. They, they have to make an application and they have to be approved. So there's no uh, spontaneous uh, children in this world. What does that signify if you have to make an application? And then finally, they're wondering what her name would be. In some of the classes, I had already talked about the importance of a name. But how does, how does this feel if the child that 
you are receiving at the ceremony already comes with a name. I know with uh, our two dogs, um, I adopted both of them from a shelter. Uh, one of them was named Hilly, and we decided to keep the name. It seemed to fit her. But the other one was named Tulip, and uh, my girls didn't like that name at all, and they decided to name her Pumpkin instead. So think about... Um, what a name says and what types of names that you would envision for your own children someday and whether or not you would be happy or satisfied with them coming to you already pre-named. All right, our next section here that I want to um, pull out is father's behavior. So in this section, let me reread it again. As a matter of fact, he went on, I feel a little guilty about this, but I did go in this afternoon and look to see if this year's naming list had been made yet. It was right there in the office, and I looked up number 36. That's the little guy I've been concerned about, because it occurred to me that it might enhance its nurturing if I could call him by a name, just privately, of course, when no one else was around. Did you find it? Jonas asked. He was fascinated. It didn't seem a terribly important rule, but the fact that his father had broken a rule at all awed him. He glanced at his mother, the one responsible for adherence to the rules, and was relieved that she was smiling. His father nodded. His name, if he makes it to the naming without being released, of course, is to be Gabriel. So I whispered that to him, when I feed him every four hours and during exercise and playtime, if no one can hear me. So this section establishes that uh, father appears to be a rule breaker in a community where following the rules is so very important. So mother is sort of smiling and laughing at this. It's obviously not something that would warrant uh, three strikes and you're out um, transgression. Uh, no release for, for father for, for um, breaking the rules of looking up the name. But adherence to the rules is not only very important but necessary in this community. So the other thing that he does, other than just knowing the name, is he begins to use this name to help this little baby uh, improve in his development. None of the other nurturers get to do this for their kids that they take care of. So what does it say about father if he wants to give this kid an advantage? Okay, If he thinks that he is able to break the rules, if he doesn't see any problem with doing something that is not allowed of everybody else.